chimpanzees. So like us, we are both captivated and repelled. As we move through the looking glass into their world, we are transformed. Chimpanzees, our forest-dwelling counterparts, unite us with the rest of nature. Eerily, they recall our prehistoric ancestors. Their social life reflects ours too, with paramilitary patrols, political struggles for power and gain, even outright wars. The tender affection they show for one another, their gestures and expressions all seem strangely familiar. Their invention of tools forced us to redefine what sets humanity apart from the beast. And now we discover that chimps developed not only tools, but entire cultures which they pass on to their young. Even medicine seems within their grasp. And when stalked by death, they seem to feel a sorrow we can share. With a shiver of recognition, we glimpse the mind of the chimp and realize we are not alone. Come with us on a voyage of discovery, a journey into our collective past. We retrace our steps back into the forest of Africa, the ancient homeland our species abandoned some six million years ago. We left behind then our closest relation, the one being on this planet most like us. For there is a mind in the forest, a mind very much like our own. And it lights the eyes of the chimp. Chimpanzees share more than 97% of our genes, and it shows. The invention and use of tools were supposed to set us apart from the other animals. But this chimpanzee is fishing for safari ants with a wand specially selected and pruned for the task. Chimps make and use many tools, skills passed on from mother to child, part of their cultural heritage. Ant fishing requires real expertise. Safari ants are a rich food source but they pack a vicious bite. With one fell swoop, they're down. At eight years of age, her daughter still has much to learn. But someday she will master this technique not just by trial and error, but by watching her mother at work. For the past 35 years, scientists have been watching and learning from her mother as well. She was an infant herself when she met her first human being, who named her Fifi. That human was Jane Goodall. 
Jane came to know Fifi, her mother Flo, and her entire family quite intimately. Goodall was the first human to be accepted by wild chimpanzees. What she discovered revolutionized our concept of chimps and of ourselves. All across Africa, others have followed Goodall's lead. A second species of chimpanzee is studied by Takeyoshi Kano. Called bonobos, they're famous for their human-like appearance and the way they substitute sex for violence, unlike the more aggressive chimps studied by Goodall and Christoph Bush. Bush has unveiled hunting strategies and elaborate tool use among rainforest chimps, leading him to suggest these things might have evolved before our forebears left the forest. And Richard Wrangham believes he may even have discovered chimps practicing a primitive kind of medicine. The new research takes us ever further into the chimps' world, giving us a new perspective on our shared legacy. Chimpanzees and humans sprang from the same primate stock. Our paths diverged only some six million years ago, with our human forebears moving onto the plains, leaving the forest to the chimpanzees. But shared characteristics are written deep in both our primate souls. Chimps, too, are capable of creating distinct cultures. Various nations of chimps cling to life across the African landscape. Chimpanzees once thrived throughout the forests of equatorial Africa, while bonobos were restricted to the Congo Basin. Today, both species survive in isolated fragments and are studied at a handful of sites. Gombe, on the shore of Lake Tanganyika in Tanzania, was where Jane Goodall began her study 35 years ago. Fifi is the only chimp still alive from that time, with six surviving offspring. Freud, her eldest, is now the dominant male in her group, while her younger son, Frodo, is the largest chimp at Gombe and working his way up the male hierarchy. Freud now leads the tightly bonded party of males that form the core of the group. Male chimps stay in the group of their birth and cooperate when there is common cause. Every week or so, the males form a paramilitary patrol to defend and test the borders of their territory. In single file and total silence, they follow their leader in search of trespassing neighbors. Hair standing on end, they listen for the voices of their foes. Each community of male chimps jealously guard their territory and the females in residence. A stranger turns and flees. Though groups of males rarely engage in battle, an individual caught by a border patrol is at serious risk. In the 1970s, Jane Goodall described a harrowing chain of events. Her study group split in two, and over the course of four years, the males of one group systematically hunted down and brutally killed every adult in the other group chilling evidence that warfare is a painful legacy from our primate forebears. Gombe's steep slopes, the stage for all this high drama, tumble from open grassland to riverine forest, from the top of the Great Rift to the blue basin of Tanganyika. Today, a new generation climbs the path blazed by Jane Goodall. <laughs> Charlotte Uhlenbrook is studying pant hoots, the long-range calls of chimps. She follows one male all day 
recording the precise time and circumstances of any pantoot he makes. Her Tanzanian associate, Issa Salala, follows another male and does the same. At the end of the day, they will compare their notes to see whether they've witnessed two sides of a conversation and to try and decipher its meaning. The pantoots are certainly conveying some meaning. Um, what, what I'm trying to find out is exactly how specific are the meanings of these different calls. I mean, um, does a particular pantoot convey something about a food source? Does it say, come here, boys? Does it say, I'll meet you up in the next valley? Or are they directed at family members, at allies, at friends? Or are they just generally anyone that can hear me? This is my message. We haven't got our ears tuned in. I mean, it's like different cultures very often. It's difficult to hear a slightly different uh, pronunciation. So certainly we're not hearing all the different subtleties. Sometimes there's still just a cacophony of screams out there. <laughs> very hard push to pull them apart, but I'm sure the chimps can. I'm sure they, they know exactly what's going on. Sometimes words won't suffice. Males perform displays, dramatic performances designed to establish their dominance and intimidate rivals. Fearless, Frodo sometimes uses the human researchers to enhance his displays. Even Charlotte has fallen prey. He'll give me a whack. He'll just, just kind of add a little flourish by incorporating me. But it's not directed at me. If he wants to hurt somebody, he could have done it. Females and their young are dominated by this threat of force. But when the fruit crop is ample, everyone feasts. A mother's care is the primary influence on a young chimp's life. Orphans find life hard. Mel was orphaned at the tender age of three. Only the generosity of others has allowed him to survive for six more years. Still, he seems to miss the affection he would have known within his mother's arms. Something this little baby seems to understand. A temporary respite from a life of loneliness. Beyond the bond between mother and child, political relationships are the life's blood of chimp society. Even while relaxing, chimps are jockeying for status. Grooming is quite literally currying favor. Alliances become apparent by observing who grooms whom. Dominant animals and their allies get the best pickings. Food is a precious commodity. They often compress fruit into a pulpy wadge, something like a tobacco chore, to extract every last drop of juice. But the calls of colobus monkeys whet another appetite, not so easily satisfied. When a monkey troop is spotted nearby, the most avid hunter recruits other males to join forces in a hunting party.
Red colobus monkeys nervously watch the gathering of bodies below. Craig Stanford studies the relationship between colobus and chimps. He hopes to shed light on the origins of human hunting. We know that at some point early in human evolution, meat became an important part of the diet. We don't understand exactly how that happened. Was it scavenging meat or hunting meat? Well, we know that the earliest stage of human evolution happened in a habitat just like this, East African woodland that's got open areas onto which our ancestors eventually moved and adapted to. So to be able to study hunting here is the best way to give us some kind of window onto the earliest origins of meat eating and our own ancestors four or more million years ago. Frodo is the best of the Gombe hunters. He's 17 years old, and yet he's killed 10% of the colobus population the last three years. It's really quite an incredible animal and a great hunter. That was Frodo. All the hunters, including Frodo, will try to catch a monkey for himself. By joining forces, the chimps hope to strand some monkeys in an isolated treetop with no route of escape, except into the clutches of a chimp. Although we see elements of cooperation at Gombe, what we think we're seeing mainly is individual selfish behavior by male hunters done within a communal setting. It's a little bit like a baseball game in that baseball is a communal game in which individual players are doing their piece. And in the end, the end result is going to be success or failure. The more hunters there are, the greater the odds of success. And yet, each individual hunter is performing selfishly. As the chimps climb up, the colobus retreat to the highest branches, too slender to bear a chimp's weight. The male colobus stand their ground against chimps up to four times their size. They will even take the offensive, momentarily driving the chimps back. Holding his tail out of the chimp's reach, this male buys precious time for the escape of the females and young. Excited by the cries of hunter and prey, females appear below. 80 feet above the ground, Frodo displays his daring technique. But this time, he misses. With chimps climbing everywhere, one monkey leaps into the arms of death. Even a rear attack by the defending colobus cannot save him. The young hunter displays with his kill, but his triumph is short-lived. Freud simply confiscates the carcass. Freud settles down to share with his allies. Meat is a valuable currency, a payment for favors. Females come begging for a taste. The orphan Mel searches for scraps, but he's soon sent packing. Frodo, frustrated and hungry, tries to muscle his way to a place at the table. But Freud will have none of it, leaving Frodo to rage. His friends rush in to placate him to little effect. With up to 11 males hunting together, multiple kills are common at Gombe. As many as seven monkeys have been taken on a single hunt. 
Chimps like a little salad with their entree. They often eat leaves when they eat meat, sometimes eating kinds they never touch otherwise. On average, the Gombe chimps consume 20% of the colobus monkeys in their range each year. A taste for meat begins early. The free-for-all approach to hunting works well in Gombe's low and relatively open woodland. Catching monkeys high in the treetops requires a different strategy elsewhere. Christophe Bosch studies chimps in the Thai forest of the Côte d'Ivoire, prime African rainforest. Most chimps live in green and shadowy depths like these. The forest canopy, an interwoven web, floats over a hundred feet above its reflection in tea-colored pools below. Following his chimps, he's discovered that they're capable of an extraordinary level of cooperation. I mean, the chimps of the Thai forest are the tropical rainforest. The canopy layer is continuous. The biggest mammal, they hunt the red colobus, they are about a third the weight of the chimps. So it means that when colobus is on a thin branch, the chimps can't go there. If you go there, you fall down on the ground. So there is a big problem. They have to use solve it. And the only way to solve it here is by hunting in group. So that a chimp will drive the prey away in a given direction so that the colobus are constantly moving in its direction. And the driver is really just pushing them in a direction. He's not trying to capture them. But as he's not running, you see that he's just walking in a constant direction. This gives them the constant direction of flight where the chimps on the ground can then organize them. And if they see that the group splits too much in different directions, you would have blockers. Individuals that come up in specific trees where colobus might escape to so keep them in constant direction. And so that gives them the possibility for them to make a kind of a trap. So that by having a driver behind, some blockers on the side, they just need somebody actually to come in front of them, ahead of the movement, and to then close the trap if you want. Only the most experienced hunters play this role. They have to race ahead, then climb almost a hundred feet above the canopy into the crowns of the tallest trees to ambush their prey. And when they are successful, it's incredible because you can have suddenly all the forest is green.